Uh, okay, so I'm your host, Bryce. Um, <laughs> per the request of Vivek, I'm going to do a little bit of the why and the so what kind of kind of thing. So, <clears throat> as you may have heard, Spectrum has customers that are platforms that consume user-generated content. So things like a gaming platform where there's in-game chat or a dating platform that works at all. Uh, there's user-generated content that you send and those types of platforms have a financial interest to ensure that your experience on their platform is pleasant so that you spend more time on it. Because essentially the financials of their system is that if you, the more time you spend, the more profitable you are, generally. Um, <clears throat> and so, to that end, uh, they, these platforms are interested in finding out disruptive behavior, identifying it, and almost as important, uh, doing something about it or taking some action on it. Our primary offerings are, uh, is a platform that detects behaviors like bullying and disruption and radicalization and things like that, but also positive behaviors that are uh, more profitable to a client, um, to a platform like this. For instance, if you're a new user or a new user signs up for the platform, the platform would really like to know who's the most encouraging, welcoming person that we can pair this new user up with to get them oriented and, and maximize their time on the platform. Uh, <clears throat> when there's disruptive behavior, they generally want to take an action like uh, take down the content if like, it's illegal or they just don't want it on their platform, or warn a user or maybe even call the authorities if uh, something is illegal. Now, in order to make these determinations of uh, whether or not a behavior is present, <clears throat> in a given conversation or message, we take signal from a few places. The, uh, there's history, what have we seen before? There's metadata about the current message, like in what context was it given, and um, how many people are involved in the conversation that this message was submitted in. And then there's the content itself, the actual thing that's being said. And we pull signal from those three primary areas, put it through classifiers and business logic to determine whether or not we detected a behavior and come up with a determination. In this case, the determination is whether or not a behavior was present. As a concrete example, if we have seen in a conversation a solicitation like, I want you, and we happen to know that this is a one-on-one -on -one chat late at night, and the response is a dismissal, go away, this pattern can repeat its sexual harassment, and you might want to uh, do something like block the person submitting the solicitation from the person who constantly rejects them. Now, the way that we deliver these inferencing results to our client is through a SAS API that is uh, a JSON payload. Customers will send us the request with some metadata and then our direct response has inferencing results and uh, some, some, suggested, some suggested actions. <clears throat> the, uh, okay, so the, the, let's start with the schema of our uh, payload that we get from our users. The most important and probably central piece is this, uh, that won't do, okay is the body of a message. It looks something like this. This is hand wavy on what we actually get, but there's the text in the message that's in the body. Uh, some first order citizen metadata, like the context in which this message was submitted, uh, direct message rather than some kind of group chat, and then attributes. The thing I wanna highlight about the attributes is that they were very intentionally freeform. They aren't part of a domain model anywhere. There are uh, common or um, reserved attribute names like user ID that have special meaning in our system. But uh, something that we'll touch on uh, about these attributes is that it, there are advantages to them being just completely freeform. One of the reasons that they were so freeform is that early on, uh, we weren't sure how many behaviors we would try to detect and we weren't sure what metadata about a message would provide signal in detecting that behavior. Uh, one of the things that we found was that the time of day that something was sent has a correlation to the solicitation of uh, prostitution. There's, there's a high correlation. And so this message is from Sugar Daddy Sam. He's in his 
50s, talking to somebody in their 20s at 11 p.m. asking how much for all night. In case your radar's not up, this is solicitation of a prostitute. And so uh, that metadata being flexible is uh, an important component to how we decided to inference in our classifiers. Now, today we have about 20 distinct classifiers. And uh, I'm an engineer. Good engineers are lazy, and they want to solve a problem once. And um, our different classifiers, as I touched on the three areas that we can pull signal from, and the fact that we don't define, you can only get signal from here, uh, this, this attribute, might imply that there are 20 pieces of code that can invoke each classifier, like the hate speech thing that knows how to feed the hate speech classifier its input. Um, there's not, there's one. Well, technically there are two, one for TensorFlow and one for Onyx, but there's essentially one place where we get <clears throat> the information to feed to a classifier. Now, I don't know what kind of world you live in. Um, if you live in a world where you get input without really doing anything to it, you feed it to a classifier, and then you get a response from a classifier and you, that's your full response, uh, bully for you, that's awesome. Um, we live in a different world where we need to do some pre-processing, get data from other places like what we've seen before, uh, and then we need to know how to format that data that we've pre-processed or parsed in, into our classifier, what uh, dimension uh, a given array needs to be and things like that. And then one of the important things I want to touch on in this session is the gray diamond after the classifier, which is some decision, which is generally some kind of action. Um, <clears throat> even if you have a classifier that detects fraud, you're not done once you detect fraud. You gotta like cancel a transaction or, you know, delegate to some representative to call it to, to um, do some kind of human action on that transaction. Similarly, our clients make decisions based off of our inferencing. Our inferencing isn't the end-all be-all. Okay, so <clears throat> I've spoken with data scientists before in the Hive that said something like, well, I created a Python script that calls model.predict and handed it to engineering and they weren't happy with it. And I, like, that seemed fine to me. As a data scientist, that, that makes sense. That's generally how you invoke your classifiers. Uh, but model.predict, which is a Keras API, um, has the first argument is x. Does anybody know what x can be? It's Python, so it's duct typing. It can be one of four things. Uh, I can't remember the fourth, but the first through third is a NumPy array, or if you're not a data scientist or a Python de developer, that looks like a NumPy array. Anyway, uh, a, a data frame, which I think is a pandas construct, or a tensor, which is a first order citizen of the, uh, I, I believe, the Keras API. Um, the fourth one, I don't remember what it is, but it's some function that does one of those things, essentially. The thing that's missing from that signature, if you're a developer, uh, you might notice, well, I don't know what shape any of those are. I don't know what needs to be in the NumPy array, how many elements it could be, does the order matter? Um, a tensor, a tensor's kind of an amorphous thing. It can, it can be a string tensor, a Boolean tensor, an int8 tensor, it can be all kinds of things. Just the signature doesn't tell you what you need. So, it seems to me you have two choices. You can uh, get together with an engineer and describe exactly what your classifier needs in order to run and how to interpret the output, uh, or you can have some kind of documentation on it that is interpretable at runtime, not just a human documentation. Um, <clears throat> so, the different types of information that our classifiers might want is you know, somewhere in this list. By far, the most common is the embedded text. So an embedding, embedded text is uh, a vector that represents a word in a sentence. Um, usually it's you know, 200 or 700 uh, 32-bit floats to represent a word. Uh, and <clears throat> there's also metadata from 
the message that a classifier can consume, like the time that a message was sent that we saw before. Uh, language, Bayesian priors, stuff like that. Um, if you're not familiar, a Bayesian classifier is one that takes a message and makes a prediction and then gets another message and it asks, hey, what did I predict last time? Give me my previous prediction. Now, my previous prediction with the current message, I'm gonna make a new prediction. And then that continues on. Every time a new message comes, it wants its prior. This is useful for uh, detecting behaviors that build over time, something like harassment or bullying. Um, one of the things that I think is more interesting in the signal that our classifiers can use is the output from another classifier. A lot of times, if you're wanting the output of one neural network inside your neural network, you need to embed that sub-neural network in yours and do some kind of ensembling in the output. And that's a perfectly fine option. What we opted for was a mechanism for our classifiers to ask, hey, what was the output of that other classifier? For instance, severe toxic might ask, what was the confidence of the hate speech and the racial slur and the radicalization, well, the threat classifier? Um, so we'll examine how these inputs can be detected and fed to a classifier at runtime. <clears throat> um, we decided not to go with a sit with an engineer and teach them all about your classifier option, and we went with self-describing classifiers. And there are two obvious ways to have a self-describing classifier. One is having a deployment descriptor with it. This is, you, you create a classifier, and then along with the classifier, you have some uh, file, like a JSON file or a YAML or something that describes things about the classifier, how to feed it. These are the inputs I need, this is where to get them, this is how to format them, things like that. So that can go in a separate file. Uh, one problem that we saw with that was synchronization. I don't want our data scientists to spend all day uh, creating a classifier and then have to remember to go and update this other file. Um, so we opted for not that option. And most ML platforms are flexible enough that they let you rename the nodes in the graph. And so we went with this pattern, <clears throat> a prefix that connotates uh, an input and then some, <clears throat> some fields after that that we'll examine a little bit more on the next slide. One of the advantages of baking this into the classifier is that uh, it communicates to our data science team what their menu of options are. We have this pretty well documented. These are the things that you can choose. If you want a tensor that is shaped this way, create a name that looks like that, that kind of thing. Uh, and this is pretty easy to parse, and uh, it's impossible to get the wrong inputs for a classifier. <laughs> um, so it, it's never out of sync, So it, because it's baked in. So the three main places that we can specify as uh, the source of data is the current message, what other things are doing inferencing on that message, and things that we've seen before. Um, among the things in the current message is the language, as we saw before, and attributes and things like that. The confidence of some other uh, classifier can be in the, the current inference. These, these three pillars here is what I'm gonna call scope. Scope in this sense says, this is a prefix that says I am an input. This is where I want you to get your information from. This is how I want it formatted. And there's a specific key in Attributes, it's kind of obvious. What's the name of the attribute? So what this is saying is uh, feed me the attribute named user sign up and interpret it as a duration. Duration in this case would be how long has it been since that timestamp that is in the attribute field user sign up. Uh, other, other things probably the most common is input.content.embedded.body. So this says give me the text of the message clean it, tokenize it, and create a two-dimensional embedding vector and feed it to this tensor. Okay, so other examples get kind of interesting. One that we'll touch on is uh, input um, the attribute of user lifetime spend interpreted as a decimal. So remember that we, we can do that. <clears throat> okay, so at runtime, uh, the thing that 
we do first when we load a classifier at, uh, at startup or the first time that we see one is, this happens to be the Onyx API. Um, you can ask a classifier session what its input names are. And for each of those input names, we do some parsing. We get a little data structure back that gives us the scope, the format, and the identifier for the information that is being requested to give to the classifier. And we happen to be in Scala, so we can do something like, if the format is text, make a text input. If the format is decimal, make a decimal input. And we'll get to what an input actually is, because it's something we kind of invented. It's not a tensor. Uh, and then this class right here that we're instantiating is the thing that has the Onyx session and has now things that are ready to give it tensors. So the inputs uh, obey this trait or implement this trait. It's just got one method for a given message and the context in which that message is being inferenced on, give me a tensor. Okay, so before we saw <clears throat> like decimal input. It takes an attribute name and knows how to get a decimal out. Well, this might be an implementation of it. So in get tensor for this message, it's going to go grab the attribute with our attribute name and convert it to a float. And then onyx tensor .create tensor gives it back. And uh, okay, the usage of this input is somewhere here like that classifier that we created, the thing that actually invokes the, uh, the classifier session goes and asks, hey, all your inputs that I know about, give me the tensors that I can use to feed to the session. Session.run takes some, some tensors. This is, I'm glossing over some details of the API, but that's essentially it. We ask inputs, give me a tensor, and then we feed those tensors to the session, and then we interpret the output. Yeah, Rohan. Uh, yes, yeah, and, and so in this, uh, there's nothing obvious about where I got the information from or how I formatted it. Um, the second argument I think that I gave for model.predict was a tensor, and that's all we're given here. Uh, in, in fact, it's the only option in the JDK, uh, in the JVM API for Onyx. Okay. The, it's, yeah, yeah, there is no bad, it's true. But there are data frames, could be Spark. Uh, all right, so that's essentially what we're doing at runtime when we get a classifier, and this gives us a couple advantages. So I think when we establish this naming pattern and this convention and kind of handoff between data science and engineering, we had something like five or six classifiers. We have 20 now, and this code hasn't changed hardly at all. Uh, so the the advantage that, um, and, and in fact, positive behaviors is a, um, is a decent example of how this changed. We created a totally new paradigm of what we're looking for. Instead of looking for toxic type behaviors, we were looking for positive behaviors. And uh, nobody needed to change any code to run them. They just follow the same pattern, pull from the same domain model, and uh, follow the same rules, and they run in here. Okay, so this is the first part of deploying your classifier to production is somehow facilitating your engineering team and runtime about how to invoke and interpret the output of your classifier. The second part is turning the inferencing predictions that your classifier returns into action. And this one's a, a little more subtle and um, I, the, the use cases that we have, uh, if you remember this, this diamond, the decision, right after here is what we're gonna be digging into uh, now. You can make a prediction, let's say, for content that somebody would like. But just having the prediction of the content that somebody may like if they watched Godfather, maybe they should, maybe they would be interested in Casino, um, just predicting it doesn't do anything. Something has to deliver that prediction to the user, that's the action we're talking about, whether or not you should recommend it. And it's not always the case that uh, a system that your classifier runs in would just blindly give that recommendation to the user because maybe it knows, I already recommended Casino and they've watched it. 
So I'm not going to recommend it to them again. What's the next prediction? OK, so examples of uh, actions that you might take. Um, oh, recommending a pur purchasing a premium service. This is, this is kind of cool. One of our clients does not allow sexual conversations on their platform unless you pay them extra. So we detect sexual conversations. And instead of them just redacting it and taking it down, the action that they take is a suggestion. Hey, that's not allowed on our platform, but it is allowed right over here. Yeah, 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 an entry fee. Uh, I, I think the last count is this generates a quarter of a million dollars of revenue for them a year. Um, that's kind of cool, because usually trust and safety is a cost center. So eh, that's kind of fun. Uh, you can notify a user of a policy violation, um, limit access to other users, suspend a user account, contact authorities if something illegal is happening, blah, blah, blah. Um, one that uh, we touched on earlier is detecting fraud. So if you have fraud detection, I can pretty much guarantee nobody's ever going to create a classifier that detects fraud, suspends the transaction, and refunds the, uh, the amount to the source account. It's probably never, ever going to happen. <laughs> so you need to know what to do because you detected something from your classifier. So uh, yeah. Sorry, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, reciprocity, uh, welcoming, tutoring, things like that, reinforce, positive reinforcement. Um, so if we detect that somebody is um, congratulating someone for, uh, in, in a game, for instance, instead of saying they cheated or something like that, that's, that's probably somebody that's pleasant to have a game with. Like, way to go, you nailed it, you know, see you next time, something like that. Yes, uh, the uh, example that I mentioned earlier, the, when a new user comes in, that user that demonstrates reciprocity and tutoring is probably a good candidate to recommend as uh, a, a teammate. Or you may give that healthy behavior demonstrating user some kind of um, like free credits or something like that. Like, hey, you earned this extra skin or you know, these other weapons, something like that. Great questions. Uh, OK. So in, in our world, the actions that we take are primarily dictated by either our clients or our solutions team. The engineers don't really do much with the uh, actions. And data scientists almost do nothing with it. But the reason that it's relevant is you want to be able to make predictions that can translate into actions easily. In our case, it's the presence of a behavior, the confidence we have that that behavior was accurate, things like that. Um, <clears throat> so decisions don't always just go off of your, your detection. So a couple of semantic examples of the conditions under which you want to take an action include if sexual content was detected in a child's game, then redact the content. Or uh, if a user's repeatedly harassing someone, then um, I think the interesting case is instead of going after the harasser, prompting the target of harassment uh, to ask them if they want help. Um, kind of, I, I think, a more, uh, I don't know, indirect way to solve the problem, but maybe, uh, maybe simpler. This one's kind of interesting. We actually have a client that does something like this. If somebody's demonstrating bad behavior, but they spend a lot on your platform, then maybe you just give them a notification. Whereas if somebody else is doing the exact same behavior, but they don't spend much on your platform, maybe you just kick them out. <laughs> so uh, yeah, this is, um, all of these take more signal than just the prediction from your classifier. All right, <clears throat> so the types of predicates or conditions that we have are behavior predicates. This essentially says, did we detect this behavior in this message? Uh, the, w was profanity used in a children's game or sexual in a children's game? The determination about whether or not the message was submitted to a uh, children's game comes from the metadata and the attributes. <clears throat> Uh, decimal attribute predicate, that actually ties to the how much does the user spend. So 
you know, you, you've got a number of them, but one that I want to highlight is this composite predicate. So <clears throat> it would be not very cost effective to write specific code to handle each action that a customer may want uh, to take after our inferencing is complete. You don't want them submitting tickets and uh, changing code to just do something simple like fire a webhook, which is something that, that we do based off of these predicates. But these things are kind of building blocks that we use to define the conditions under which we take an action like firing a webhook and the composite is probably the most powerful. It doesn't make any decision by itself, but it has a collection of other predicates that it tests, did this predicate match and that one and this other one, then if all of these were true, I'm true. Uh, so we have and, or, and not as conditions, and then you can create an entire tree out of these things that match the semantics that we uh, had in our previous list. So an example of implementation of something uh, that performs this logic that's sort of pluggable and composable is just a pretty simple signature here. Uh, we're taking two things, the message that, was, that had inferencing performed on it and the output of that inferencing. And so in a behavior predicate, we might ask the results, give me the detected behaviors and was there any overlap with the target behaviors that uh, are listed in, in the constructor. Another one, the decimal attribute, this is the one that uh, checks to see if a person's a high spender, goes to the message and it doesn't look at the inferencing results at all and interprets the attribute name like user total spend as a float and compares it to some threshold. And then we've got the, the combination of these. So um, you can see how it can indent and, and make uh, pretty sophisticated decisions. And essentially what you're giving your users or your solutions team is some kind of menu of decision points in, uh, in this decision tree. And so this has turned out to be pretty, pretty powerful from, um, in, in our experience and has reduced the kind of custom coding that we would, we would need to have. Um, and a lot of it fits just because we aligned it to our data model and that our data model is kind of uh, flexible. So anyway, um, yeah, that's, an overview of how we deploy a classifier without having to write specific code for it and take action without having to write code for that. So yeah, I welcome, what, it, what do you guys do for, uh, how do you <clears throat> deploy a new classifier and, and take action? What does it look like in any of your systems? It looks a lot like that. It looks a lot like that, that's cool. We should maybe team up and I bet some people in this room would probably be good team members. Yeah, Any, anybody doing anything different? I mean, I would think so. Yeah. Uh-huh. Good deal. And uh, I'm, I'm curious about how long has that been in place? I mean, we, we've kind of been adding to it. I think we might know how long it's been in place, the validation stuff. But... Oh, yeah, the validation piece, yeah. I see, yeah. Um, yeah, about eight. Uh, about a year. Yeah. About a year, okay. Because I think we had discussed something like this so, before um, then. Yeah, it's a little separate. We, we have the same sort of, we built a structure for holding Boolean logic mm -hmm. for firing automations out to say this and that and the other thing, which um, is not tied directly to, uh, to inference, but mm -hmm. you know, running after that, taking the inferences into consideration. Not in 10 milliseconds, for sure. <laughs> we, we get away with just having these things run on a five minute timer. So. Hey, I mean, there's no reason to uh, make it super duper fast if people aren't using it all that fast, yeah, so yeah. that's so fine. You haven't, you know, had to build it all in as tightly as what you have to do by, uh, you know, by just the, the um, by what you do, by what you have to do, I would say, yeah. 
One thing I'd, uh, um, I didn't actually create a slide for, but that I, is maybe relevant. There are uh, three main places. Yeah, I think three main places where we want to make some decision this flexibly. Um, the first place is in our API response. So I indicated that our API will give the result of our inferencing, our behavior determinations, and suggested behaviors. These are uh, just tags. They're just metadata that we put in our response, but the presence of those tags is dictated by those predicates that I described. Another one is webhooks. So uh, one of the things that you might want to do is say, all right, if we already took action from the API response, but this message would have otherwise matched the conditions that would require this webhook to fire, we know we already took action from the uh, API response, so don't bother firing off a webhook. And the third place is whether or not we want a case to show up or how in our moderation queue. And that code that I demonstrated of, this is the thing that actually makes the decision, lives in all three of those places. And so uh, we get a lot of mileage out of this. Yeah. It's kind of it's nice. Yeah, Rohan. Um, I guess just going back to like the code class butter for a second. Mm -hmm. Uh-huh, yep. Um, is that trade used across both Onyx and TensorFlow, and are there any differences? Uh, great, great question. They, the signatures are um, nearly identical. The semantics are absolutely identical. And the only reason that they differ is because the thing that they return needs to be feedable to the... Um, the machine learning runtime that you're going to give it to. And so they are different traits, uh, but they look exactly the same. In fact, they both return a thing called tensor. Just one of them is in the TensorFlow package. Uh, yeah. No, there's not, to my knowledge, a central like mm, JSR uh, type specification for the interfaces and, and data models for inferencing. It's all ML platform specific. Awesome question though. So you allow, you have some uh, <clears throat> input attributes that are, are uh, reserved essentially to mm -hmm. allow ar other arbitrary inputs. Are those uh, accessible, or the arbitrary ones that are unknown accessible to this system? Absolutely, yeah. And so I would assume different customers would set different arbitrary attributes. So you make it this, they do. it's sort of a, if this one exists, use it, or, mm -hmm. and, but in the same model, you don't have separate um, versions of the models per customer. We, we actually support that, yeah, but uh, in practice, it doesn't happen a bunch. Um, I think part of the uh, early idea was a uh, contract of getting feedback or labeled data from the client, but uh, they, they don't seem to like to do that. <laughs> so, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, why aren't you detecting this or why? Anyway, um, so the, I think the power comes from the fact that, that uh, we'll allow any of those attributes. And um, really the reserved ones that I was talking about, like user ID and things like that, came about basically from experience. We were getting people send, sending uh, player ID and then user ID and username, and we're like, God, we're not going to make a classifier that has eight of these, and we constantly use that, so let's standardize it. So once we hit something that we identified, this has some pretty strong signal that we want to use in lots of places, then we standardize. And essentially, it's a documentation problem at that point. We go to our solutions team and we're like, hey, talk to the client, ask them to change player ID to user ID. And if you happen to be a very big client that pays us a lot, you don't change it. So, <laughs> yeah. Anything else? Are you guys ready for a keynote? Let's go to a keynote. Thanks for coming. Thanks for all the support, guys. Yeah.